So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We know you have your options and how you spend your time. So we want to thank all of you for choosing to be here today, um, this afternoon. My name is Mona Vies, and I'm project manager for Community Centered Long-Term Services and Support Outreach. And I came to Card Across Disability Coalition, or CCDC, back in June of 2021. And at that time, I immersed myself in learning about the upcoming changes. And um, as I was going through that process, I learned um, that the challenges that people with disabilities face are universal. And for example, in my own family, my aunt, um, my aunt on my father's side was married off when she was 18. And my uncle went blind late in life. And my aunt um, wasn't able to work because she had a high school degree and she didn't have the skill sets to hold a meaningful position. And so they lived in what we call low income with three kids to raise. On my mother's side, my grandmother lived, grew up and lived in rural India. And her, um, she went blind very late in life. And she could get around, no problem. But it wasn't until she fell that changed her life. My uncle was very concerned that she would fall again. And so he made her a cart made of wood and four wheels. So she sat on that and used her arms to get around. So I know physically and emotionally that had to be very challenging. And so for people like my family and others in living in India, there aren't these services, um, long-term services, there is a Medicaid program. And so an organization like Colorado Cross Disability Coalition would have been very helpful. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit about who we are as an organization, what we do. And then Julie will talk about uh, basics of Medicaid and then uh, the current assessment process and the upcoming changes. So who are we as an organization and what do we do? Um, so we're a member, statewide membership organization. and. Card Across Disability Coalition has been around since before the ADA was signed. And membership, um, yes, membership is free uh, to anyone who supports our mission. And when the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed, then CCDC made it its mission to ensure that all organizations and companies throughout Colorado were in compliance of the new law. And over time, it evolved into an advocacy organization for justice, social justice for all Colorado, Coloradoans with seen and unseen disabilities of all ages. And that's what cross disability means. It means um, all kinds of disabilities. And so today, some of the social justice issues that we focus on are health care and health equity, transportation, voter engagement, housing is a big issue for us, uh, employment and income security, um, income security. And so, um, and so I want to mention that um, we do have extensive experience advocating for client-friendly Medicaid policies. What I really want to mention is that as a statewide member organization, it's our members who come to us with issues and concerns that might affect all Coloradoans. And that's why we're here today to talk about these changes because it does and will affect all, um, all Coloradoans. And, um, and as an, um, 
statewide member, statewide organization, we ought to gain credibility. We also partner with organiz, um, organizations such as the ARC organization, the Reciprocity Collective that works with um, un, the unhoused community and um, Northwest Colorado Center for Independence. And then there's another reason why this is so important. We wanna make sure that all Coloradoans have access and equal access to um, Medicaid and Medicaid services, whether you live in the Denver metro area or you live in rural areas. And so if you want, um, want to learn more about us or want to become a member, um, you can visit our website uh, and uh, sign up to be a member. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, we're very active there. And then I'll talk about other ways to get involved with CCDC um, at the end of the presentation. So Julie. Thanks, Mona. Um, so what we're, we're gonna go over a few different things. And if you have questions in the chat, Mona and Jose will monitor the chat and let me know if I missed anything. But we'll also stop kind of at each point to see if there are questions and people can either put them in the chat or just unmute yourselves and ask at that time. Um, so I'm Julie Riskin, I'm the director of CCDC. And I, I know some of the names, see some of the names here, um, but not all of them. It's always good to see people I don't know too. So we're going to start by talking about, you know, kind of a very brief overview of what Medicaid is, then talk about um, how, how people get long-term services and supports and what's changing. Um, and then we're going to talk about also what's changing in terms of how people are assessed, case management, and then um, a, a new process for, for many um, about how budgets will be set in the future. And then again, as Mona said, we'll end with, so what, how do we get people involved? Because anyone who knows us knows that we're always about getting people, particularly people with direct experience involved in the policy discussions, because ultimately how good these programs are, are up to us. So Medicaid, um, and Medicaid is a, is a big complicated program that does lots of different things. And we're not gonna try and talk about all of it because we would need a year and a half, not an hour and a half to do that. Um, but Medicaid is for both low-income people and working adults with disabilities. And for adults with disabilities who work, it is our, our only path out of poverty. Um, and that, that's a relatively new thing, which is really exciting. I think most people would agree that not, not being poor is, is, be is better than being poor. Um, I know I certainly prefer it. Um, the Medicaid is also the only funder of what we call LTSS or long-term services and supports. And that's really important because if someone has a significant disability where they need help with activities of daily living, unless they either have a very large family of people that aren't doing anything else or a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money, I'm not talking middle class or even upper middle class, but a ton of money, they're gonna end up using Medicaid because that, that's the only way to get these. Private insurance doesn't cover these services and Medicare does not cover these services. The VA covers them, but only if you got your disability in the military um, in, in active service. Um, Indian Health Services doesn't co cover these. Medicaid is the only place where you can get these services. And we'll talk about what these are, but it, HCBS or Home and Community Based Services allow people with significant disabilities to live in a community with necessary supports. And it allows people with very, you know, so some people who use these services have more mild disabilities, you know, where they, they need some help, but not a ton. We also have people on these programs that um, have very significant disabilities and need someone with them all the time. Um, and, it and it helps everyone. And the Medicaid buy-in for working adults with disabilities was created so that people could have home and community-based services and work um, and pay a monthly premium. And both regular Medicaid for home and community-based services, even if you don't work, or the buy-in offer home and community-based services. So, so there's, when we talk about Medicaid, we kind of talk about the two sides. 
So the, first, the side that everyone knows about is, is what they call state plan Medicaid or regular Medicaid. And that's, that's like, like, it's not health insurance, but it's like health insurance. It's the kind of stuff that health insurance would cover. So that would be like doctor, medicine. Um, um, it also includes mental health, including substance abuse treatment, it includes transportation to medical appointments. That's unique to Medicaid. Private insurance doesn't do that. Um, but it, it includes things like, you know, getting an x-ray or going to the hospital, having an operation. It also has a limited dental benefit for $1,500 a year for adults and unlimited for children. The side of Medicaid we're gonna be talking about today though is the non-medical side or long-term care, long-term services and supports. And there's two ways to get those. One is institutional, um, which is in a nursing facility or for people with developmental disabilities, it's called a ICFIDD, an intermediate care facility. We don't have hardly any of those in our state anyway, but we do have nursing facilities. So people could be in an institution and most people don't want that. Um, and we've certainly learned the past few years why had it really thrown in our face in a very tragic, sad way, why that's dangerous. Um, because, you know, when there's a respiratory infection, it just spreads like wildfire, even if people are trying really hard not to have that happen. Um, there's a lot of other damage that happens. So a lot of people, and also people just want to live in their own homes and their own communities. So most people prefer, and in Colorado, most people receive services through home and community-based services. And they're called waiver programs. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But the services, you get these services on top of the regular Medicaid. And those are services like um, personal care. And that for some people that might be like very skilled stuff that maybe, you know, in, in, if you weren't in long-term services, it would require a nurse, um, but also personal care or even just housekeeping. Um, respite for the family caregiver transportation for things that are not medical. So like maybe going to work if you can't use the bus and you don't, you don't have public transit in your area or going to the store, or if you're in a faith-based community, going to your house of worship, um, going to get your hair cut. We were talking about not getting a haircut earlier. Um, all of those kinds of things. They, they also have home modification. And for, for people with developmental disabilities, they even have things like job coaches. So there's, and, there, and I'm, not, I'm not going over every single benefit. There's a lot of benefits and these benefits are all designed to help people get through their day. And that for different disabilities, that happens in different ways. But there are, again, there, it's not like a doctor. It's all stuff, you know, again, that helps people get through their day. So long-term services and supports are for people of all ages. So we have um, clients that are very young children on these programs. We have people in their 90s and over 100 and everything in between. I think sometimes when you hear like long-term care, you think, well, old people, and you also think nursing home. That's not what it is. It, again, it can also be physical assistance. Like, and again, a lot of people think, oh, so personal care means like physically helping someone who's disabled, like, you know, use the bathroom or get dressed or take a shower. And it, and it is that, but it also can be things like supervision and cueing. So you might have someone with, um, with a, a brain injury or a serious mental illness. And what they need is they don't need, they can physically get in and out of the shower, but they might need someone to remind them that it's time or help them with the steps it takes. A lot of people who have executive function problems might not be able to organize their thoughts to say, okay, before I get in the shower, I need to get the towel and my clean clothes and I need to make sure the soap's in there. And just those things that a lot of us just do kind of naturally, they might need help with that. Um, some people can do fine with all of the personal care, but they might need support to be able to keep their life together. So that might be um, someone might have like really severe anxiety and can't use a bus and needs more of that personal direct transportation so that they have a structure, so that they're going to work, so they have a structured day, and um, but they can take their shower and everything by themselves. Um, it might mean homemaking, especially people who can't, maybe they physically are okay, but they can't organize day programs for someone who maybe has dementia and they're living with the family, but everyone's gone during the day. Um, the other thing that's important to know is that people don't have to be housed to receive LTSS. 
we know we have more and more folks who are living without housing and they have a right to get these services and they can um, get them anywhere. We have had complaints and we are interested in hearing from folks if you run into this of people that are being denied these services, not, not so much by the Medicaid system, but for example, someone might be living in a shelter and they're told, no, you can't have someone come in and help. So we're really eager if, you, if people are aware of those to tell us about that, because that would be a violation on the part of the shelter violation of the ADA. Um, and also people might must be assessed annually. I'm gonna go shut my door. Um, and so, and there's, um, and, and these, uh, this PowerPoint will be sent out afterwards. And so when you see where you see links, you'll have the live links, obviously on the, the one that you get. So we have waivers for a bunch of different populations, um, for children. And so a way, so the waiver is actually the program. So it, and it, it doesn't even matter why we call them waivers at this point. So we have different waivers for different populations. And I think a lot of us hope that at some point we won't have so many that we'll just have them more broadly. But right now for children, we have one for children with life limiting illness, um, one called CES, Children's Extensive Support for Kids with really significant disabilities where like they need help during in the middle of the night and they have to be redirected like almost you know hourly um, during the day. Um, CHIRP is the Children's Habilitative Residential Program and that's, that's out of home or kind of semi out of home but in the family home. Children that need again very have significant behavioral issues and need kind of a placement but we want it to be in the community. And then children's home and community-based services, which is mostly for kids with serious medical conditions. For adults, we have one for people with brain injuries. And in each of these waivers has a set of benefits that go with it and a set of what they call target criteria. So the target criteria is what kind of disability do you have to have to be in this waiver? So like obviously for the brain injury waiver, you need to have a diagnosed brain injury. And then there, a lot of the services I discussed are in all of the waivers or most of them. But then for example, the brain injury, there's some special equipment you can get in that waiver that you don't, you can't get in others. And they have a thing to teach independent living skills in that waiver that they don't have in the others. So there's one for brain injury. There's a community mental health services waiver that I personally think is way underused. Um, that, and that's for people that have a serious mental illness who again, probably don't need things like help like with bathing or dressing or physical, but they might need help with cleaning their house because they have, they lack the organizational skills or may have a disability that affects their motivation. Um, and I don't mean that in a judgmental, it's, it's a brain science thing where some people with certain disabilities, particularly schizophrenia, they can't, their brain doesn't say, gee, the house is a mess. I think I should sweep it up. It, they'll just sit there and be uncomfortable and, and then people end up getting evicted because they, it goes on and on. And then, and then we have a real problem. So having someone come clean their house once or twice a week makes a ton of sense. We have two waivers for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We have one that's called Supported Living Services, SLS. That provides um, less than 24 hour care. Like it's supposed to be intermittent support living in a family home or one's own home. The reality is the majority of the people that use this waiver do need 24 hour support, but the other waiver called the DD waiver, developmental disabilities waiver, is the only resident, like true residential 24 seven program and they have a waiting list. So a lot of people are on the SLS, but they're waiting for the other waiver. And the other, the, the developmental disabilities waiver provides 24 seven support, usually in a host home, it's something called a host home, sometimes in the family home and sometimes in a group home. And then they, there's day services also that go with that. So there's kind of the residential side and the day side. Um, the largest waiver is the elderly, blind and disabled known as EBD. And for that, you have to either be elderly, which is over 65. That's what the federal rules say. I didn't make up that number. Blind um, or disabled. And if you're not on disabled is just 
you are disabled by social security standards. But if you work and you're not on social security or maybe you're, you're not on it because you have para or something else, you can get a disability determination from the state because, and they'll look at all of those factors other than work. So like the, anyone who knows social security knows the first thing they ask is, are you working? And if you say yes, then there's a problem. Otherwise, um, and then um, if, and then they don't look at that for this. And then finally, there's a spinal cord injury waiver. So there are a bunch of changes coming. And the reason why we, we're doing this program, and I want to just give a shout out to the Next 50 Foundation, because they funded us to, to be able to do this, to be able to put time and money into having these presentations and having meetings and really being able to organize this is because we feel that um, it's really important that people know about the changes and that even if things go perfectly, change can be hard. And we're, which is why we need what we keep saying there's an army of advocates out there to make sure that people's rights are protected and that the changes happen the way that they're supposed to and the way I think we all intend them to. Um, and so we're actually gonna be going through the training with the state um, on these new tools and how this all works. And then we're gonna develop a second training for doing presentations just like we're doing here, explaining that as, as we go along. So I also, I also think it's really important to know that the purpose for these changes are not to cut services or benefits, but to improve outcomes and services. And to make this work, to make the, and when I say this, I mean the whole long-term services system. Everyone knows that us boomers are, are getting older and there's gonna be just a greater need. And so with the program getting way, way bigger than it used to be, it's really important that we have a way to provide services fairly across the state, not based on who you know, or do you know the magic words and those people get everything they need and no one else does, which is kind of what happens now in some ways. Um, so they always, at, at, at Medicaid, they always say things like um, the right services um, in the right time and the right amount and in the right setting, and that's good. But what is right is determined by the client, and that's really important. So, you know, you saw that the Department of Healthcare Policy, or HICPUF logo, was on the front of this presentation, or maybe you didn't notice that. They've seen this, they know, they've been to some of these, they, they know exactly what we're saying. And I know this is recorded and put on the, on the internet so that we are um, saying very clearly that this, this is not the purpose and they have backed that up and said, no, this is not, the purpose is not to cut services. Um, and so, but part of why we want people to know what, what the rules really say and how everything really works is so people services um, don't, get, don't get cut because they didn't know what was going on. Are there any questions? Oh, I see there's a lot of chat. Um, oh, okay. I guess it's all the same thing. Is, um, are there any questions before I move on? Okay. So now we're gonna talk about the assessment tool. Um, and it's funny, it says the input, we designed this a long time ago. It says the in-person and we're still not doing in-person assessments. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see once things unwind, if, if how much people feel the need to go back to in-person assessments. Currently the regulations require it and, and there was obviously a exception for that for the pandemic. But I think people have learned that, so I think what we've seen at CCDC is some of, the, some of the people really, I think it's been very bad for them not to have an in-person assessment. It's not worked well, but for other people it's worked just fine. And so hopefully we'll be able to get a little more flexibility there. So we're gonna now talk about what's an assessment, why is there a new one and kind of who cares? What is it, why does it matter um, that we're doing this? So the, the first thing that's important is, and this is true now, um, is, you know, we talked about the two kinds of long-term care, that there's a nursing home at, or there's in the community. 
to get these waiver services, you have to meet what's called a nursing home level of care. But that word scares people because people say, well, I don't want to go to a nursing home. Well, trust me, I, I use these services. I don't want to go to one either. And I wouldn't. Um, it's just the word that comes from the federal law that comes from policy that was made 40 years ago that to say you have to meet nursing home level of care. And all that means is that you need help from a human more often than not. Um, and it doesn't mean that you need to need help all day or even every day. It just means that you need some, someone or something to get through your day because of a disability. So it's just the language. So it's important to explain that to people because everyone we're training, everyone who goes to these, we're hoping you're going to go out and talk to your peers and your friends and your families. So, you know, again, I could see, you know, an older person who's experiencing age-related disability seeing that word and saying, oh, no, I'm, I don't want it. Um, we don't want people to say that because the people need to know that you don't have to go into a nursing home ever if you're eligible. Some people think like that the state can like put you in one that they can't. They'd have to get a court order. And um, and that and luckily in Colorado, we just don't see that happening. I, I can't say that's true in every single state, but there is not really an interest of forcing people into something that provides, you know, less than optimal care for over $8,000 a month. So there isn't really an interest in forcing anyone into a nursing facility, even by, even if you're saying someone doesn't care um, and they're just, you know, motivated by something else, even by money, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but, and so the assessment is to see first, do you meet that level of care? And then if you do, to, to decide, so what are all the services that, what are, what are all of your needs? And the state might not be able to meet all of your needs, but they want to identify all of your needs and then identify what services could help move them. So that's that's the point of the assessment. Um, so the, so then it's like, okay, so who does this assessment? Well, that's done by a case manager, and they're there to help you determine your needs and identify the next steps. But and this is nothing against case managers. Um, because I think, again, most of them are trying to just do a good job and want people to get what they need when they need it. But even with the best of case managers, it can be a very uncomfortable process uh, because their questions are super personal. So, I mean, I've had case managers that I've become personal friends with. It still was uncomfortable because, again, generally you don't talk about things like, you know, bathing and toileting and, you know, very personal and like every single medication you're on and all of that with other people. It's just something we generally don't do. So when someone's suddenly coming in and often someone that you've never met, it is uncomfortable and there's just no way to make it not that way. So, um, so it's important to let people know that it's going to be uncomfortable. It's also important. And this is, Again, I don't want to generalize too much because I don't think it's unique to older people, but I think it, particularly with older folks and others, it's important to have someone with you if, because a lot, as, or people new with disability, because we all want to put our best foot forward and look good. And because our society is kind of ableist, we tend to think that acknowledging disability makes us not look good. So, an example, I, I was talking to some people that work with mostly seniors the other day is you might have a senior and someone comes in and they say, well, do you have trouble getting dressed? And the person might say no. And, and they're dressed, you know, and they look okay. What they didn't say is it took me two hours to get dressed or, you know, or, you know, I can put on pants and a shirt, but I can't put on socks. And on a day like today, so what? On a day like last week, you're going to get frostbite if you've got to go out. So, the, you know, it's not just can you get dressed? It's can you get dressed in a reasonable amount of time? Can you can you dress for the weather? Um, maybe someone can put on a T-shirt, but they can't put on a warm shirt. And again, it depending on what they do and where they work or, you know, what they have to do and the temperature, that T-shirt might be fine, but it's not going to be fine every day. So, is, so sometimes having another person there who can help remind someone who can say, yeah, I know you can get dressed, but you know, last week you didn't go to church, which you love because you said it was too exhausting to get yourself up and dressed and ready. That would be indicative of someone's making those kind of choices and then isolating that they probably need long-term care and are probably eligible for it. 
but it is the person's choice who they want attending the assessment. It is totally their choice. It can be, they can have five people there, they can have no one there. Um, but again, we do encourage people, especially people that are not used to doing this, to have someone with them who, who understands and who, and who can remind them of what they might have told the person. The other thing is, it's just sometimes there's so much information, it's just hard to remember um, everything. So they'll, they'll ask you about all these different activities of daily living. They're going to ask you about, you know, what medications do you take? Um, how do you, do, you know, showering, toileting, dressing. They're going to ask about um, how do you make financial decisions? Do you need help? Do, can you do your own banking? Do you, when you need, when you run out of medical supplies or medications, do you call the doctor or do you need someone else or the pharmacy? Or do, you know, all of that kind of stuff in a lot of detail. Um, they're, they're also gonna ask about um, like memory, cognition, behaviors, which again, can be very uncomfortable to talk about. So most people don't wanna say, yeah, when I get really anxious, I just lose it and melt down because we've created a lot of shame about that. So, but it's really important again, to answer honestly, or if you don't know, um, to get some, to have someone there who can answer honestly. So someone, for example, who maybe has depression or bipolar might need a family member there when they're asked about, you know, your appetite is, you know, it might be, well, you know, no, they, they might say, oh, no, I feel like my appetite's fine. And their person might say, well, but, you know, last week, you know, when you said you couldn't sleep, you also missed more than 50% of your meals because you said you weren't hungry. For someone who's bipolar, that's not a really good sign. That might be a sign that some more support is needed. Um, and then some people just have memory issues, um, particularly if they're stressed. Um, if they're going through something that's really stressful, they're going to forget more. They'll also ask about goals and what's important. You don't have to have a goal. I mean, your goal can just be, I want to live my life, but some people have a goal. Their goal might be, I want to get a job or I want to get a dog or um, or I want to just start going out of the house more, or I want to plant a garden, but you, you know, but it's not, it shouldn't be taken as we're going to have a goal and then we're going to measure you and you're going to get somehow punished if you don't do it. It's just the services should go, should be centered on what the person identifies they want. They'll ask about your routines and if things need to be a certain way. Um, one of our board members um, who uses these services has this very bizarre medical condition that comes with like, I would say like she's allergic to everything on the planet. So, and so she needs things to be a certain way and she needs people who come into her home to not have been around someone who was smoking and for them to not wear perfume. And if that doesn't happen, she can go into anaphylactic shock and need an EpiPen, which is, you know, dangerous. So it's important to know those kinds of things. They're also gonna ask about what we call so-called natural supports and we have concern about this. And so it's important if you're, if you're a family caregiver that if, you know, natural supports are, are basically supports that aren't paid for. And we want, when people are supporting each other, like a true natural support is reciprocal. It might be that, um, you know, it might be with a neighbor that, you know, one neighbor, you know, shovels your snow and then the person who gets their show, snow shovel babysits that person's kid. It shouldn't be someone without a disability always doing something for someone with a disability and not getting paid for it. That really harms good relationships. There also shouldn't be an expectation ever that a family member should just be a caregiver just, just because they're a family member. Now, many people do choose to have their caregiver be a family member, and that is absolutely a choice. Um, and there's a million things that are dependent on that, including culture. Um, of, of people, you know, people in different cultures, some cultures um, want that, others don't. I think, um, you know, whether or not you have family around, we see it a lot in rural areas, um, but we, I mean, in some in urban. Um, so that should always be a choice, but it shouldn't be done without pay. And there shouldn't be an assumption that because you're married to someone, you have a kid, you have a parent, that that means that you are a full-time caregiver because without pay. Um, so be careful when, when you're asked about natural supports, be honest, but be careful to not kind of say, oh, I have all this available when it's not sustainable. 
a lot of times when people apply for these services, their families and friends are kind of at their wits end and are super stressed. And so it might be that, you know, your spouse has been taking care of you, you know, doing all of your care for four years. But if they don't either get some relief or they're able to maybe be paid, so they're not trying to do that and work. Um, that, that things are going to implode and, and the marriage is going to get wrecked um, if there isn't some sort of change. So just be very careful about that. Also, parents who are caregivers for their adult children. Um, I, I have an adult child with a disability and I think we all like to think that we'll be around forever, but we won't all be around forever. So if we're caring for an adult child, we need to be honest with ourselves and realize we're not going to be around and they need to get our adult children need to get used to um, having support from other people than us. And that's so that when, when we die, they are not, their life is not thrown into total chaos. It'll be hard for them no matter what, but it'll be a million times harder if they're not used to getting help from other people. There's also a part in the new assessment tool where you can share your story and you're gonna either be able to do that online ahead of time or in person. And that's because uh, when we were testing these ideas, a lot of clients said, I'm sick of having to say the same thing, kind of like how I got here to like so many different people. Um, and I, and I kind of want people to know, you know, maybe they want someone to know I have seven grandchildren or I used to be a business owner before I got my disability or whatever it is they want someone to know. Um, it could be something about them. It could also be, what do they want anyone to know before they, come to your house. So I don't really care if anyone knows my story, but I do want someone to know um, before they come to my house that I have um, large and very enthusiastic dogs. And so probably sending someone who's afraid of dogs, especially large dogs, is not going to be a good thing because my dogs like to be very um, vocal and demonstrative, um, usually in the form of bad manner jumping with anyone who comes in. Um, they're not going to hurt anyone, but they do scare people. So, but you, so you can choose to do that. You can also say, you know, um, I have, you know, I know there's some religions that they expect people to take off their shoes when they come in the house. Like you could say that, um, whatever it is that's important for you. And then it's added in there. It, this is also going to be great for people with communication accommodations. So if someone is, let's say someone has, is hard of hearing and they need someone, if they're wearing a mask to wear a clear mask, they can put it in there and then the people can be prepared so that they don't have to go through it every single time. Um, we have a lot of people that can't use encrypted emails and that's a communication accommodation that they often ask for. So if it's right in there, they can know, you know, don't send an encrypted email because they're not gonna get it. Um, so again, once, so they're gonna do this big long assessment and then after they have the information, they develop what they call a support plan. And that's, kind of what you get, how much you get and what you get and where you get it and all of that. And then there's also a mandatory check-in with the case manager each quarter. Um, I personally hope at some point we will change that and say that we can use a little bit of judgment and spend a little more time with those that need it and not call every single person, even those that are capable of reaching out themselves or have family. Um, but right now they have to check in every quarter and in the, at the six month mark, they have to do kind of a mini assessment. Um, on the PowerPoint that we're gonna send you, we're gonna send a waiver chart that lists every single service that possibly exists and each waiver defines what it is, which waivers it's in and um, what the exact criteria are for every waiver. So you can spend hours going through that if you want to. Um, the, the case manager is also supposed to tell you what your rights and responsibilities are. And again, you can choose whoever you want to be part of the development um, in the support plan. So um, some of your rights, our rights and responsibilities are um, to include who we want um, in the process to, to get support if we need it. So an example of this might be um, as someone who's deaf needs a sign language interpreter for their assessment. That would be, a, you know, something that would have to be provided. Or it might be that um, someone has really severe fatigue 
and they can't do something that's going to take two and a half hours. So if for them, it might be you're going to do two shorter assessments, but whatever it might be that they want a friend, um, uh, you know, with them or someone that cares about them, you can choose um, any long term program that you're eligible for. So someone might have a brain injury, a physical disability, and a mental health diagnosis, they'd be eligible for three different waivers. They can choose whichever one they want. Um, they can also, you can also choose any qualified Medicaid provider. So for example, if you get, um, if, if you're getting a transportation, there's, depending on where you live, there might be a number of transportation providers. In some places there might only be one, and then you don't really have a choice. But if there's five, you can choose whichever one you want. Um, you can also change providers at any time. Now I'll say as a caveat, right now, that means assuming you can find a new one. There's a huge shortage um, that's nationwide. So you might not, you know, th there might not be as much choice right now, but that's more of a function of the world than the rules. Um, you also have a right to be provided with um, services and supports that don't have a conflict of interest. And we'll talk about that later. But the person who's advising you um, shouldn't be, their employment shouldn't be affected by how, but they shouldn't work for the same company as, as the service providers. You can choose where you live and receive services. And again, that's limited by what you can afford. So we can say you can choose where you live. I know, um, you know, not all of us could afford to live in Cherry Hills. Um, quite frankly, even those of us who live in Denver now couldn't afford to move to Denver today. Um, but you can, within what you can afford, you can decide where you wanna live. If you wanna live in a rural community, you have a right to, and no one gets to say, well, that's not realistic because you don't drive um, or whatever. You have a right to get a copy of your plan um, and anything really that's written about you and to know at least 15 days in advance if your services are gonna be stopped or changed or reduced. And then you also have a right to continue your services if you appeal quickly. And again, we could talk about appeals a lot. There isn't really time, but CCDC does a lot of work in this area. I want, but I do briefly wanna talk about the difference between a grievance and an appeal, because they're both important. So I would say a grievance is about what, how they act and an appeal is about what you get. So um, a grievance is something like, if you feel like the case manager or the supervisor was like rude or short or didn't, didn't really tell you all of your options, or if, the, if you go to the doctor and like they're, they're rude to you, or the receptionist is mean. Um, if, they're, if you report a quality problem and no one will help, like if you say, you know, I've had a homemaker, but like they won't really clean the house, you know, in a way that I feel like it's really clean. They just kind of go over it really fast and then say they have to go and no one will help you deal with it. Or if you call and no one calls you back. Any of those things are things you file a grievance and people say, well, what good does that do? I file a grievance and they write it down and do something, you know, but what is it? And the answer is sometimes it does nothing. Um, but sometimes it does something. So some, some people do take grievances seriously and they'll actually look at those and address them and fix the problem. Even if they don't take it seriously, all of the people that contract with Medicaid have to report to the state the grievances that they get and what they did. So when Medicaid is looking to recontract with people, they do look at that stuff. So if we wanna get unresponsive people out of our system, that only happens if people file grievances. There are, um, you know, there's sometimes people complain and complain about the same situations, but then when Medicaid looks at those things, looks at those contracts, they say, oh, well, there's been no complaints. And then they really can't do anything. Um, it also helps for the good companies. If they see grievances, like the managers, they can see a pattern. And, and so maybe it's that, um, and this has happened, maybe it's, maybe they're getting a lot of complaints about people not calling back. And they go and they research it and they're like, oh my goodness, we had case managers leave and we didn't turn, we didn't forward their phone log to the new case manager. So there were all these messages that were going and no one knew they were there. And it was, it was something that was a mistake. It was an oversight. It wasn't intentional. But if no one complained that they don't know, because you don't know what you don't know. An appeal, however, is a formal process where an administrative law judge hears your case. 
And an appeal is if any service or benefit is denied, reduced, terminated, um, suspended, or a request is not acted upon. And that doesn't mean not returning a call. That means if, for example, if a case manager sends um, a prior authorization to the system, like for people who use long-term home health or who have high costs, it goes to a company called Telogen. And so a case manager does the assessment, they send everything to Telogen, Telogen doesn't respond. And then now all of a sudden it's the end of your period and there's no new services authorized because the case manager can't because it wasn't responded to. If you file an appeal, your services have to keep going um, it, because, because that, that would be an, an example of non-response or a request not being acted upon. And so we have a saying at CCDC that we stole from Colorado Legal Services and that is appeal first, think second. So if, if you ever get, a, and we tell people, if you get a denial or a termination or something, it might just be a mistake. It might, it might be a misunderstanding it, or it might be real. You don't know, but often there's a really short window. So we say just file an appeal so your services keep going, then we can figure it out. If it turns out that it was a mistake, the, the system can fix it and then you just withdraw the appeal after it's fixed. Or maybe it was a misunderstanding. Maybe when you were talking to the case manager, it was they had a really bad connection. And when you said, oh, I really need these services, they thought you said, I don't need these services. I mean, any of these things could happen. But if you just accept determination, you're never gonna know. Um, so we, we always encourage, and we, we can help people with appeals, but sometimes when things get really busy, we'll say to someone, just file something and we'll jump in later. But we really encourage people to appeal first and you can always withdraw or maybe they, you get something reduced and, and after sitting down and, and understanding, you realize, yeah, you know what, that was that decision was right. I should have this reduced. You can always withdraw. Julie? Yes. I also wanted to mention, so, since you're talking about appeals, one of the things also we have a, uh, great page with videos about how to appeal and, and what an appeal is. So if you go to www.ccdc.org, I mean, ccdc.online.org. Ccdc .org. Thank yes. you. Uh, you can uh, and, and go to the page, need help. Uh, you will be able to scroll down and read through a whole process of grievance appeals on how you can do it on your own and start Thank you. Before, before we take it over or, Thank or you. help you. Thank you, yes. Um, and, and we encourage people, even if you're not a client, to look at that so that you might be able to help clients. We also have responsibilities as clients, which is to give, again, to give accurate information, even when it's hard, to cooperate in, with providers and case management when appropriate. And I say when appropriate because Sometimes people are asked to do things that are inappropriate. So we've had examples of providers with home care agencies asking clients to sign a blank timesheet, which could be used for fraud. You obviously shouldn't cooperate with that. Um, but you know, if when the case manager says it's time to meet, um, you know, to return their call and work with them on a date. Now, if the case manager says it's time to meet and it has to be Tuesday at 10 and you're working Tuesday at 10, it's okay to say, no, I can't do that. But it's not okay to just not ignore them. Um, you need to let your case manager know if you have changes in your support system, health, if you're, if you're in the hospital or if you plan on moving. And, and very importantly, you need to let them know if you're not receiving services that you should be according to your plan because they've authorized the services and they're not gonna know um, uh, the systems are a little messed up. And so like, they don't always see if no one's billing and they have so many clients, they might not notice. So if you think you're supposed to be getting a home modification or transportation and no one's showing up and you don't know what to do, you need to talk to your case manager. So any questions before I start talking about what's gonna change with the new process? All right. So the current assessment is called the ULTC 100.2, and that stands for Uniform Long-Term Care Assessment. I don't know why the 100's there, but the 0.2 is because it, it's the second one. That only develops the level of care. It doesn't really develop the plan or it's kind of used for it, but kind of not, and it's inconsistent. Um, and so, um, and then 
for people with developmental disabilities, they use something called the supports intensity scale, which is this long assessment that is awful for uh, people. They, people have taught, felt, said it feels like an interrogation and there's all kinds of problems with how the CIS has been used that I won't get into now. So the new assessment, it's gonna be longer and more inclusive, but it's also gonna allow the state to identify all of the needs um, and both assess what you need and then look at the support plan together. It will be automated. Um, so you won't have to keep saying the same things over and over and it will be a way for us to get away from the CIS. It will also include questions for everyone. Cause the other thing now is you do this assessment but you have to kind of know what you're asking for. So not everyone gets the same information. So this will be more structured where everyone will be offered, for example, the opportunity if they wanna self-direct their services, for example, like with consumer directed attendance support or in-home support services. Right now, um, particularly with consumer directed, you have to kind of know about that option. And that's the service where, you, um, where we're able to hire our own workers without going through an agency. Um, we, we go through a training to learn how to do it, and then we um, can hire our own workers with, and stay within and decide what they're going to be paid, when they're going to work, what they're going to do, and stay within a set budget that is, that is based on our needs. So um, everyone's going to be offered that. And again, that isn't, it isn't a program for everyone. It doesn't work for everyone. It does work for a lot of us. Um, and they're also going to ask everyone, you know, appropriately about employment. When I say appropriately, they're not going to be asking the seven-year-old about employment. They may not be asking the 96-year-old about employment. The people that are, you know, working age, they're going to ask. It's not going to be a pressure, but they, but they also want people to know and people will be told it's no longer true that you can't work and have Medicaid. A lot of people think they can't earn money. Um, and that's, that's not true in Colorado. You can earn money and you can earn quite a bit of money and keep your Medicaid. In the current system, only people with developmental disabilities use an algorithm, which is the CIS, which is basically you do this assessment and then a, a number pops out. And we'll talk about algorithms a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but the algorithm, the CIS algorithm is there's, it's not transparent and there's no meaningful exception process. The other thing on the current system is what you get depends on where you live, not so much zip code, but what part of the state. So there are areas of the state where the culture is, we wanna get people all the services they need and keep them engaged in the community. And unfortunately, there are parts of the state where the culture is any use of taxpayer services is bad and we should limit it as much as possible. Um, and so that is just not fair. Um, so the new system, we're all gonna to have to use an algorithm. Um, and there's certainly, reason to fear that, but there's also a reason why I, I think it can work if it's done right. And that's a big if, um, because the new algorithm will be transparent and there'll be an exception process. And what, what, what you get will be fair across regions. So you'll go, so whether you live in Denver or whether you live in um, Canyon City or Olathe, you, you should have a similar result to yours, the same result to the assessment. Now. If you live in Olathe, you're not going to have as many service options as you do if you live in Denver. That's true now. Um, but if you're using like self-direction, you shouldn't get, if you have the same type of, dis the same means, you're, you shouldn't get a number that's three times higher in one county than another. Um, and, and again, some of it is just having something that's more standardized and more structured should help with that. Um, the other thing with the CIS is it is, it is, because the state went many, many years ago, no one who works there now, but many years ago, they kind of messed with how it was implemented. It undercounts everyone. So it, it doesn't measure huge chunks of people's needs. So most people, it, it just undercounts what they need for most people. So um, I'm gonna talk about case management if there are no questions. All right. So we're also changing, so we're changing the assessment tool. We're also changing case management. Right now, if you have developmental disabilities, you use a community center board. And if you don't, you use a single entry point. And if you're kids, you kind of have a mishmash where some, they can use one of those or private case management agencies. 
So what they're doing is they're calling a case management redesign. And what's going to happen is there's going to be one case management agency per region that will serve all people with any kind of disability. And it doesn't matter what waiver. So you go in and you apply for long-term services and supports. Then you get told what waivers you're eligible for. So again, a lot of people with developmental disabilities also have physical disabilities or mental health issues, and they might be eligible for one of those waivers. And it depends, there's so many variables. You can't really say which is better because it depends on what you need. So the reason for this, there's two reasons. So, in, so right now we have two systems. So we have 24, one of them has 24 entities, the other has 20 or 22. So the state will be better able to manage and hold accountable when we have maybe 20 instead of 40 something and entities, because these are all different contracts and with the single entry points, half of them are with county government. Um, and they have, it's just all over the board. But they're also different regions. So the CCB region for county X might be different than the single entry point region, which is super confusing. Um, and so, Hopefully it'll just be better accountability and management. And the other thing is it gets rid of the conflict. And this conflict only exists in the developmental disability system. It's never existed or hasn't for decades existed in the single entry point system. So right now, in, in a lot of cases, the community center board that does the case management might also be a service provider or the only service provider. And that doesn't, I'm not saying that people are doing anything malicious or bad or evil or hateful, but it's human nature. We, we hopefully tend to think our employers are doing a good job and we like the companies we work for. Um, now I know that isn't universally true, but hopefully it is true, I think for most people. So if I'm a case manager, let's just say CCDC is a case management agency. I'm a case manager and I do an assessment for Jose and determine that he needs a home modification. And there's five companies that do that in his area. And I say, okay, well, there are five companies, Jose. Um, here are these other four, here's a list, you can call them. But if you wanna use ours, the one that we provide, I'll just go down the hall and talk to my friend who provides service. So he's probably gonna say, okay, just do that. That sounds better. So then I do that. And let's just say, you know, they build a ramp and Jose's rolling out down the ramp, but falls apart. And he calls me saying, well, these people did a horrible job. I'm more likely to get defensive because it was my friend. It's or the person, or maybe not even a close friend, but like someone who works down the hall and I don't really want to get in a big fight with them because then I'm going to have to explain it to my boss and it's just going to be really uncomfortable. Whereas if I have no connection with any of these people, I'm much more likely to be willing to hold them accountable. And again, it's just human nature. So, you're, so there's going to be either a case management agency um, or a service provider. So some organizations might split, like they might decide I want to be a case management agency and half of our business is going to go to, you know, some other organization um, that they can do that. And again, it'll, it'll, it'll also be more efficient, I think, better economies of scale to do case management. And finally, we won't be segregating people by disability as much. So for example, Someone who has Alzheimer's or a form of dementia might have very similar needs to someone with developmental disabilities, but in the single entry point system, they're not support, they're not expected or supported to know how to deal with cognitive disabilities. Um, whereas in the developmental disability system, they are, um, but there might be someone with a developmental disability who really doesn't need that support or who has a family member that's doing all their management. And so it just makes sense to have a case management staff that's really trained for the broad spectrum. And that doesn't mean that they won't specialize, especially in larger ones. So I would assume like Denver would probably have, you know, a large amount of case managers and they're going to have some that are, that maybe specialize in brain injury or some that specialize in mental health. And that's totally fine, but they will have to know all of the waivers right now when people try and switch waivers, especially between a DD and a non DD, it's really hard because no one system knows both pro knows both. So we're getting into the last part. I know I've been talking a lot and talking fast. Um, are there other questions? Any? Okay. Um, I don't see any. So, um, 
So now we talk about the algorithm and that word is kind of scary. Um, so what's gonna happen? So first of all, this is not gonna happen for a few years. The tool is gonna start being used in October. Um, that's the latest date. They have to collect data on the tools. So they've got to train all the case managers. There's a lot that has to happen. Then they've got to collect data for about a year to, to be able to build the algorithm. The algorithm is not built. And so an algorithm is um, just, again, talking about it kind of gives me a headache, but it's um, a step-by-step -step process commonly programmed into computers. And it's kind of a mathematical thing. That's why it gives me a headache. Luckily, we have some folks in our community that are, have degrees in engineering and understand this stuff, and they're going to help us understand it. So you get all this information from this assessment. It goes into this. They, they, they type it into a computer, and then an algorithm will, will give ranges of your, what you're eligible for, and it'll be a budget. Um, so it won't be specific services. It'll be a budget. So it'll say, okay, based on this, you know, so-and-so so is eligible for uh, $250 a day of care. Like that's, that's about what it needs. And there's, again, all kinds of factors that go into it. So then someone can decide, well, what's most important to me is, you know, I want door-to-door -door transportation, even if that means I get fewer hours of care, but I need care X number of hours a day. I'll, those of us who use consumer direction do this now. We decide, is it more, is it, do we need someone at some super odd hour, in which case we're going to have to pay more um, per hour, or are we going to be flexible and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm around, you can come, you know, at a time that's convenient, but then maybe you, you ask for more, you get more hours and you pay a little less. Um, we all, we all make those calculations. You, this will be just a broader application of that. So you'll have a budget and that budget's based on your needs. And then you figure out how to how, what services you, you want um, that you're eligible for. And um, so what, what in other states where they've had these algorithms, there's been three things that have, algorithms can either work and make things more equitable and more fair so that it's not, well, you know, this person belongs to an advocacy organization and knows all the right things to say. So they get everything they need. And then this other person you know, lives in a rural area and they're isolated and they don't know anything to ask for, so they get nothing, um, which is a lot of what happens now. Or it can be a disaster. And this is where I say it's up to us to make sure it works. So where it's in other states where it's not gone well, there's three things in common. One is managed care. The, some company like, you know, Centene or Amer or WellCare or some, something like that comes in and they're running these, it's not local case managers, it's not local providers, it's some corporate managed care company is running the show. Well, locally in Colorado, we have in our state law that you can't have, they can't do managed care for long-term care. And we intend to do everything possible to keep it in our statute. Um, the other thing in, in states where it's gone wrong is they've had, um, they've bought algorithm tools and assessment tools from corporations and then you can't see what's behind them. You can't see how it works because they say it's a trade secret or proprietary or whatever. In Colorado, and part of what's taken so long and it's been kind of frustrating that it's taken so long is we built ours. We took some stuff from some, like we took some stuff from Minnesota and from a CMS tool, but we basically built it and we're building ours ourselves. Um, and so, um, so, we, so we're gonna get to see everything. Um, the training is going to be online, so anyone can look and see how case managers are trained. Now, most of us are not going to be able to figure out how the algorithm works on the back end, but the state is allowing some advocates who actually can understand this stuff in. They could let me look at it. I wouldn't be able to tell you what I was talking about, but we have people who do understand it. So there will be transparency, and anyone who wants to look can look. And then the final thing is that when states do it really rigidly, there's no exception process. It's like, here's what it said, doesn't, you know, cause no matter how good of a thing you design, and I think we've tried really hard to design this. I mean, advocates have been involved on this for years. Um, we've tried hard to design a good thing, but even if you try and design it well, no, you're never gonna do something where everyone's gonna fit. So, I mean, yeah. When you, when you, just before you started talking about the algorithm, well, actually, Right when you started talking about the algorithm, 
you were mentioning how uh, how the, the the assessment based on needs work and how it's going to work with the with the algorithm. I don't understand what how is the the the, the needs based system different than it is today. Is that different than it is today? Yes, because so so you what you know is the CDAS system, which is right. probably the best system. So it'll it'll be kind of like that, but it'll it'll again it'll go into a computer and generate something, but it'll be based on you know again like with CDAS, you, it's based on the time it takes and how often you need something. So that'll all be very similar. It'll just be universal for all services and all programs. So what I'm suggesting to Hickpuff, which is to create a menu of services that goes beyond just EBD or just beyond people with AIDS or, 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 or whatever, you know, whatever uh, uh, waiver we're talking about. Is that what, what this is? Uh, I, I, not not exactly. I, I, think, I think at some point this will feed into simplified waivers where we have like an adult waiver and a child waiver or an, a, a two adult waivers, one is for severe needs and one for everyone else or whatever. Um, but but this, what this should do is so you go through the assessment and then they say, you're eligible for two waivers or you're only eligible for one or you're eligible for four. And then they tell you what each of the service packages are and you can, you decide. And then once you, then it's like, okay, so you, you've just, you've chosen el elderly, blind and disabled. Um, here are the service, you know, so here's the, about the amount of money that you're going to be eligible to have. Here are the services and what they cost. Um, mm. And so you can just, so someone might say, I just want everything in personal care and I'll figure out my own transportation. Someone else might say, transportation to get to work is more important than anything else. So I'm gonna, that's gonna be my priority. And, and it doesn't mean they can't get personal care. It just means if they're gonna use transportation, you know, twice a day, seven days a week, they're gonna have less. Just those kinds of calculations. But, um, but, it, but if someone has like very high needs, their number should be higher. So some people might be able to get a lot of hours every day and transportation seven days a week. For other people, it might be more of a choice. Um, obviously, if there's a home modification, that would probably be figured in separately because you don't get that every year and they're very expensive. So you wouldn't be expected to like, well, I'm getting a, an accessible bathroom so I don't get personal care for six months. I mean, it's not going to be like that, but it'll be, it'll be kind of like the CDOS process, but it'll, it, it'll also be more fair because right now, two people with two different needs um, with the exact same needs get rated very differently depending on where they live. Um, mm. And that isn't fair. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and, 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 and hopefully, again, we wanna have a lot of advocates involved in explaining this, but the goal is that it's standardized enough and the case managers get trained and they they're gonna have to be like tested so that you don't need an advocate to get a fair result. Because the bottom line is there's 80,000 people in all of these programs and there is not the advocacy capacity in the state to go through an assessment with 80,000 people. And that's another reason why we're doing this is because we want people to understand the process and then for there to be a lot of peer advocacy. So what we're gonna, once the tool is ready, we're, we're gonna be trained on it and we're gonna go out with another round of trainings and ask people to learn this so that instead of, saying, oh, there's three organizations and you know, good luck trying to find one of them, that we have peers all over the state, people that might be using services that might help five other people instead of, and that's better because there'll be people that you know. Um, and then if you run into real trouble or you have to have an appeal, then you call us, but right now there isn't, you know, or, or your art chapter or your independent living center or whoever. But we think that there's like faith leaders and community leaders and just, you know, we talked the other day to some people and they were uh, probate lawyers, but several of them were retired. We're like, hey, you, you need something to do. You can help us. Um, so there's all kinds of people that we think we can train that can just help not not make it a full-time job, but help a few people in their community. So is Hickpuff on board with saying, for example, CCDC can help you? Oh yeah. I mean, we're getting trained right along with their staff. And cool. again, they, they, everything we're saying, we've said before, we've said in front of them, they, yeah. 
I mean, I think they realize that in our community, we have a, we have a, we have a, a pretty organized disability community and we can either do this right or we can have a lot of drama and then go to the legislature and then have the legislature micromanage them, which I don't think is in anyone's best interest. Um, but I also think the people that are there now, and, and the reason I say it, and the reason I want to have things so regimented, I do think that many of the people who are there now um, really do want to do this right. Um, I think, you know, this administration really wants to do this right and doesn't want to hurt people. But, you know, we all know that, you know, elections have consequences and that we're not always going to have people that are friendly. And so we need to plan a system for any that, that will withstand time. So yeah. um, Moan is gonna go over, and now we've talked about why it's so important to be involved. Moan is gonna talk about how you can be involved. Can I pose a question, please? Of course. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie. I'm with Rocky Mountain Human Services. Um, we have CCB and SEP services. Uh, I just have a question for Julie regarding um, a previous slide. When you said it was in our state constitution prohibiting managed care, isn't the Innovage PACE program exactly that, managed care? That, that's an excellent question. Thank you. And I'll even remember your name because that's the same as mine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yes. Um, so that it, there is an exception for PACE, um, but yeah, you're right. PACE is managed care and it's in our state law, not our constitution, although that would be kind of cool. Um, but but there, there is an exception for PACE and that's because it's Medicare and Medicaid. It's uh -huh. not pure Medicaid, but, there, okay. but, it, but PACE is specifically called out in our law. Okay. And then I have a secondary question, which mm -hmm. I might be jumping the gun. Maybe uh, Mona's going to cover this. And the second question is, how do you anticipate this new um, assessment tool uh, to be used for, let's say, SEP to conduct um, assessments for nursing facilities or for uh, PACE assessments when those agencies um, actually provide the, the service plan or the service uh, planning? Well, this is the reason why this, that, that, I'm really glad you asked that because that's another reason why we need this um, because it's a huge conflict of interest to have someone do the assessment and the service plan and profit from the services. Um, it, it's, it's not a good model. And so the SEPs will do this they, the, so that there will be one assessor and that, I mean, one, one agency that's authorized to do assessments. Now, if someone's in pay, so like, like with PACE, for example, and PACE is a, called the Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, and it's a Medicare, Medicaid managed care program where you get into this program and they are supposed to um, provide all of the services, medical and non-medical, that you need. So obviously this would just be the long-term care side, but so you would do that and then say this is, you know, kind of what you're eligible for. Um, and, and again, the medical side would be a little different, but or you would do it to say, yeah, you're eligible for long-term care. And then if they choose a nursing facility, then, then they would go to the nursing facility and, and it would be the same process as now. But hopefully it will get the nursing facilities out of doing their own assessments because that is very problematic. Um, we, we also have found that there are people in nursing facilities. And in fact, um, I believe a letter was sent out today from the Department of Justice about this. Um, that have very minimal disabilities and like they get in a nursing home maybe because like they were sick or they were in the hospital or they fell and they needed rehab and then they just get stuck there. So I think having an independent party going in and doing ongoing assessments is a, is a very healthy thing. Um, Cause right now you can just get in there and then no one ever looks at you again. And that, that's not, not proper. Does that answer? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So are there, are there any other questions before? Oh, 
Okay, Mona, why don't you tell people how they can stay involved? Yes. And before I do that, um, I'd just like to ask everyone to um, stick around for a couple minutes at the end. We do have a two question poll that we'd I'd like you to answer and it's a very quick 15 second um, poll. So thank you in advance for that. Yeah, so how do you get involved? Um, and so CCDC it strongly believes that systems system changes only work when people are directly affected, um, when pe the people who are directly affected are involved at all levels. Because we know our lives, we know our needs and our communities. And so we're inviting all of you to get involved. And some of the ways that you can get involved are to become an advocate um, or um, join an oversight or advisory committee for your local case management agency. You can watch for opportunities uh, to work with the state on the person-centered budget algorithm if, um, if you like numbers and math to ensure that it's fair and considers all the different possibilities and issues. Or um, as Julie mentioned, we'll be training advocates um, on this new tool to help other individuals in their communities to get the services they need. So, um, um, so we'll be um, beginning that later this year. Another opportunity is um, this project or this new assessment tool and case management redesign are so big that we created a steering committee, a special steering committee of local leaders. And off of that steering committee, we have three subcommittees. One of those is the new assessment tool subcommittee. Another one is the case management redesign subcommittee. And the third one is outreach. So if you're interested in joining any of these uh, subcommittees, please reach out to me and I will get you set up. We do have um, our new assessment tool subcommittee meeting um, this coming Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then lastly, um, contact John Barry at john.r.barry at state.co.us. His um, distribution list, he sends out a newsletter about twice a week, and that includes information, uh, uh, memos about up, uh, some changes that are happening in the state um, with respect to um, different um, uh, disability-related uh, concerns. And then they, he also sends out, um, in that um, memo, he sends out emails about upcoming meetings with their links. Uh, so that's another great resource. And so we want to thank you. And again, if you want to sign up to get emails about what's happening, there is a link here. So, and again, we'll be sending this presentation out to everyone along with a few handouts on case management redesign. So, um, thank you. And then beyond this point, we have frequently asked questions uh, for you to review. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. My contact information is at the bottom. Um, are there any questions? All right, I'm going to pull up the poll. And I want to say thank you to everyone for attending today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Julie. Julie. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Jose. <laughs>